Right now on Morning News Now, scenes of desperation in Gaza after another deadly weekend with Israeli forces advancing. Hospitals in the war-torn territory are on the verge of collapse, while calls for a ceasefire to protect civilians are growing even louder. We have the latest from the ground. And the new hope of a potential deal to free some of the hostages held by Hamas. Back on the sand, Donald Trump Jr. is set to be called as the defense's first witness in the $250 million civil fraud case against himself, his father and brother, and their family business. We'll preview his appearance. Plus, with the deadline to a possible government shutdown looming, House Republicans have unveiled their plan to keep the government funded. We'll take you through what's in the proposal and what isn't. And if you are counting the days until Christmas, guess, get this, over the weekend, the world-famous Rockefeller tree arrived here in New York City. But what goes into picking the world's most famous Christmas tree? Today, we'll talk to the man who makes it happen each and every year. He's the head gardener here at Rockefeller Center. He's got an awesome job. We're going to dig into it. Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining us on a Monday. Joe is off today. We're going to get started with the humanitarian catastrophe unfolding in Gaza right now. This morning, two of the area's biggest hospitals have stopped functioning, according to the World Health Organization and the Palestinian Red Crescent Society, after being left without power or water. Israeli forces launched an assault on the Al-Shifa hospital over the weekend, claiming Hamas has a command center there. The IDF has not provided evidence to back up that claim, while hospital staff have denied the allegations. These pictures show at-risk newborn babies at the Al-Shifa hospital. A doctor inside told NBC News that they are among 36 babies in desperate need of care after being taken off of incubators due to a lack of power. He said three babies had already died over the weekend. Speaking yesterday, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told Face the Nation that the United States was pushing Israel to protect civilians. The United States does not want to see firefights in hospitals where innocent people, patients receiving medical care, are caught in the crossfire. And we've had active consultations with the Israeli Defense Forces on this. In a few moments, we'll hear from the spokesperson of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Alana Sinenko. But before that, let's get to NBC's Jay Gray. He is in Tel Aviv for us. Jay, good morning. So let's start off with the situation at Gaza's hospitals, what we just laid out there, including Al-Shifa, as we were discussing. Dire and perilous, that's the description from the World Health Organization. And that's, again, where those pictures of those babies are coming from. What is the latest there right now? Yeah. Yeah, and difficult to look at. What we can tell you is on the ground and from the air right now, there are reports that the fighting has intensified. Air strikes as well as ground fighting near many of the hospitals in Gaza. And the WHO is saying uh, that Gaza's biggest and most technically advanced facility, Al-Shifa, right now, quoting here, is not functioning as a hospital anymore after days without power, without water, without basic medical supplies there to help some of the thousands who are there and injured. Uh, we know that there is, according to these doctors, constant gunfire and bombing in the region. The IDF has denied hitting al-Shifa and has accused Hamas, as you talked about, of embedding key infrastructure in and around that hospital and others. They say they are going to continue to root out Hamas, whether it be near these hospitals or in the dense urban centers, that this fight's going to continue. Jay, as we mentioned, medical staff inside, you know, the specifically about these babies really sounding the alarm. Is anything yeah. being done to try to evacuate them or, or the many others hold up inside? Obviously, the big question is, how does that even happen if they need the type of attention around the clock, if they need to be transported somewhere else? And is there anywhere safe to go? But that was big talk over the weekend that there was sort of these corridors opened up to do so. But is that really even helping anything or a viable option? Yeah, and here's the thing. We've seen a lot of people moving through those corridors, most of them walking by foot four and five miles at times. As for those babies taken out of those incubators, because as you talked about earlier, no power and no oxygen supply to help those children. Uh, look, there are more than those 36 babies that need to leave. There are critical patients there that also need to leave. There have been ambulances in the area. The problem is many of the roadways out have been bombed. They're impassable by am ambulances. We know the IDF has been communicating with some of the human rights organizations, trying to figure out a way to get some of these patients, including those babies, out. To this point, though, uh, we've seen no indication that that's happened at all.
And Jay, all this is happening, though, as thousands of Palestinians either have already evacuated this area in the north of Gaza to head down south or continue to do so sparingly. Uh, but, you know, the southern part of the Strip yeah. also has seen a lot of bombing as well. What is the situation in terms of finding somewhere safe right now within Gaza? And are the humanitarian pauses that have been happening here and there making any difference? Yeah, it's kind of a mixed bag, Savannah. Look, I don't, it, it's less intense fighting in the South, but I don't think anyone would say that it's safe by any means. We have seen, uh, you know, tens of thousands daily walking through those corridors, getting to areas, but we know that there was uh, some airstrikes yesterday near some of the camps that they are staying in, some of the shelters that are being used for those who have made the trip from the north. And, and we also know that during one of the humanitarian pauses for, for moving people through the corridors yesterday, that had to be stopped down while people were in the middle of that trip because of intense fighting as well. So it's certainly not even a safe passage at times for so many who are trying to get out of the north. All right, Jay Gray, thank you for your continuing reporting from Tel Aviv for us. Yeah. Let's now bring in Alana Sinenko for more on what's happening inside Al Shifa Hospital. Alana, good morning. So we just heard mm -hmm. about life inside the hospital from Jay Gray. We've been seeing these images of these babies. But tell us, what are you hearing firsthand from Red Cross workers? And what type of care is even able to be provided at this point? I speak every day with our own surgical team that is now based in one of the hospitals in Gaza, European hospital, which is in the southern part of Gaza, uh, which is supposed to be a relatively quiet and safe area. Uh, but they also report that every night they spend several hours without sleep, uh, which makes it extremely difficult to uh, care for the patients the next day. And they're running out of the essential mm -hmm. supplies, things like like gauze and anesthetics to be treated these severe burn, uh, burns uh, cases that they keep receiving every day. So this is the situation in the uh, southern part where uh, things are better and uh, things in the north are much, much more dramatic. So when we speak about evacuating uh, these hospitals, we also need to think uh, which is the alternative facility which would have the capacity to receive and treat all these patients. Yeah, as we continue to talk about those evacuations, we're actually also hearing that the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, your organization, has said that no one is leaving through these evacuation corridors as they are afraid to step outside of the hospital. Tell us about that. I mean, and even if you do make that decision to go ahead and try to evacuate, is the only option to walk from north to south? What is the transportation situation like? Walk us through the decisions that people even have available to them right now. Our colleagues in Gaza are receiving calls every single day, calls from frantic uh, civilians, people who are desperate, who say they're wounded, who say they're trapped and ask uh, to help them to evacuate. It is extremely frustrating and heartbreaking to be getting all these calls and not to be able to reach these people because the security situation, even for our own teams, is extremely precarious. Last week, we went to Gaza City to deliver urgent medical supplies to hospitals. Our own medical convoy came under fire. And uh, when we were on the way to the Gaza City, we saw uh, thousands of people on the road walking, um, elderly, people in wheelchairs, women, young children. It is heartbreaking to watch. And uh, civilians report that they, are, they just don't have the safe conditions and the necessary basic conditions to be able to evacuate. They walk for tens of kilometers, past dead bodies, um, without food and water. This is not the conditions under which people can live. How concerned are you that this is going to get much worse? Can you imagine it getting much worse at this point, especially for people like those that are either receiving care or sheltering at these hospitals? <laughs> Looking at the images and hearing the reports, uh, receiving these phone calls from people, it's just hard to imagine how worse it can get. But uh, the situation is urgent and dire because there's no food, there's no water, uh, there's military, heavy military 
hostilities taking place in the heavily in the densely populated areas. So it is a very desperate situation. I don't want to speculate, but uh, we urgently need to make sure that these people can receive uh, humanitarian supplies that they need. Alana Senenko, we appreciate you joining us again. We will continue to check in with you. Uh, we'd love to keep talking to you. Thank you very much. Well, the call for a ceasefire is intensifying, with protests popping up in dozens of cities across the world over the weekend. Meet the press moderator, Kristen Welker, sat down with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss the future of the war with Gaza, including a humanitarian pause on bombardments in the region. Hello there, Joe and Savannah. This week on Meet the Press, I spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Here's what he had to say about the ongoing protests around the world calling for an end to civilian deaths in Gaza. French President Emmanuel Macron has said there is, quote, no justification for the ongoing bombing of civilians. All over the world, you've seen protesters who are calling for an end to civilian deaths in Gaza. Can you win this war without global support? We will win this war because we have no other choice. There's no life for us. There's no future for us and our neighbors if we allow the axis of terror led by Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, and their minions to dominate. We have an alliance for peace on the other side. It includes Israel, the United States, the modern Arab states, and the rest of the civilized world. Now, it's a question who wins. We have to win. There's confusion in many parts of the uh, of the world. I have to say, not in the United States. I'm glad to see that the the majority of the American people support Israel. They understand that we're fighting the just battle of civilization against barbarism. But those who uh, those who protest for Hamas, you're protesting for sheer evil. There are a lot of misguided people out there who don't, don't know the facts. You're talking to people who deliberately targeted civilians, who raped and murdered women, yeah. who raped, uh, uh, who, who beheaded uh, men, who burnt babies alive, who kidnapped uh, little babies and, host and, uh, and Holocaust survivors, you name it. These are the people that you are supporting. Now, you cannot, it's like in World War II, yeah. the Allies are fighting the Nazis, okay? Chancellor uh, Kohl of uh, Germany said that Hamas are the new Nazis. So imagine now, the Allies are fighting the Nazis. They've in invaded France after they were attacked by the Nazis. They uh, they go yeah. into the cities of Germany. They're obviously, the Nazis are fighting within civilian quarters, and civilians get killed. In fact, many of them were killed. Millions were killed. And, now, who do you protest against? Well, do you and protest against the Nazis, or do you protest... Uh, against the allies. And what these people are doing is protesting for sheer evil. That's wrong. Ms. By the way, it's a condemnation. It's an indictment of higher education in some of our universities. You can see my full interview and a lot more at meetthepress.com. You can also get more Meet the Press here on NBC News Now every weekday at 4 p.m. All right, Kristen Welker, thank you very much. Well, five U.S. service members were killed during a routine training exercise on Saturday after a military aircraft crashed into the Mediterranean Sea. According to officials, the incident happened during an air refueling mission. Well, out of respect for the families, the Department of Defense is withholding the identities of the crew members for 24 hours to notify their next of kin. An investigation into the crash is currently underway. Well, former President Trump's son, Donald Jr., is set to take the stand today for a second time in his father's civil fraud trial. The defense will make their case trying to prove Mr. Trump and his family didn't intentionally take part in any wrongdoing. Prosecutors wrapped up their arguments last week after hearing from 25 witnesses, including the former president, as well as his sons, Eric and Don Jr., and his daughter, Ivanka. The New York Attorney General's office alleges that the Trump organization grossly inflated the value of company assets to the company's advantage. Former President Trump and his children deny those claims. NBC News correspondent Bon Hilliard is here, along with NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, for a closer look at this trial. Lucky me, you're both here on set with me. Good morning. Great Good to morning. have you both with us. So, Bon, let's start with you and just what we can expect from today's proceedings and hearing potentially again from Don Jr. Right. We're now almost two months into this case, and the prosecution rested its case this last Wednesday when Ivanka Trump took the stand. Now it's the defense calling up their witnesses. Don Jr. is coming back to the stand. He is 
is going to face that questioning from his own defense lawyers and Donald Trump's defense team here. We heard from Don Jr.'s testimony, the first go around, as well as his brother, Eric Trump, an effort to distance himself mm -hmm. from what was actually laid out in the financial records, which led to this lawsuit here, and making the case, uh, essentially, that he was in the position of an executive, even a trustee at one point, and he was not looking at the exact minutia. Of course, there were some records, which definitely questioned the extent to which the kids were actually aware here. Mm. But the defense is going to try to lay out here that in no way, shape, or form were they attempting to uh, uh, create financial fraud that would put them or the, the business in jeopardy. Danny, as we mentioned a moment ago, we have heard from Tom Jr. in this already. Former President Trump's lawyers didn't cross-examine him when they were called by the prosecution. Explain that strategy to now call him up again rather than having cross-examined him then or, or in addition to having cross-examined him then. When the plaintiff or a prosecutor calls a witness, they have the burden of proof. So if you're the defense, you wait and see what they say. Typically, you can only ask questions on cross-examination cross about issues that came up on direct examination. So the defense appears to be thinking, and this, this is mostly because they didn't cross-examine him at all, mm -hmm. that whatever information they wanted to get from him, they figured, will We'll just leave that for direct because at the end of the government's case, we want to move for a directed verdict. We want to limit their testimony, control it. And then when we get into our phase of the case, we'll get into some of the other things that maybe we think the state didn't ask about mm. in their case in chief on direct examination. Got it. And Von, who else are we going to hear from? Who else is on the defense's list? Of well, the defense, uh, as of the end of September, turned over to the judge a list of 127 potential witnesses. Now, that's the reality here is we don't expect all of those individuals mm -hmm. to take the stand. The defense has already said that they intend to have their case wrapped up by December 15th. So again, we're looking at about a month through this process here, but we could see Eric Trump. We could see Donald Trump take the stand again. The chief financial uh, officer, Alan Weisselberg, there was a key financial executive at Trump Organization who testified under oath in response to the prosecution's questions uh, that Donald Trump had told Alan Weisselberg that he wanted to inflate the value of their properties. We could very well see the defense come back at him looking for some specifics on that account. Before I let you both go, Dan, if you don't mind, if we switch gears to Trump's election interference case, that is set to start in March. That He's denied any wrongdoing there as well. But last week, actually, his attorneys filed a motion asking the judge to allow the trial to be televised. Um, what do you think is behind that request? Why would he want that? And how common is something like that? Uh, here's why he would want it. He wants to try his case to his jury, which is the media. Part two is, uh, will it happen? Zero chance. <laughs> and here's why. There is a federal rule that absolutely prohibits cameras in criminal courtrooms. This is not a case where the judge can say, Boy, I, you know, normally I say no, but in this case, it mm. sure is of public interest. No, absolutely not. Maybe in state court, depending on the state and depending on the rule. But in federal court, the rules are crystal clear. They absolutely prohibit cameras in criminal courtrooms. The only uh, person who can change that is either the Supreme Court, maybe Congress, but certainly not a district court judge. All right, there you go. Danny Savalos and Von Hilliard, fresh off just getting married. Thank Congratulations. You. Great right, to see you. Thank, Thank you. you both. Now to Capitol Hill, where House Republicans are trying to sell their plan to avoid a government shutdown. Speaker Mike Johnson unveiled the plan for a two-step continuing resolution, as it's called over the weekend. Under the plan, several spending bills needed to keep the government open would be extended until January 19th, as you see on your screen, while the remaining bills would go on a continuing resolution until February. But with the Friday night deadline fast approaching. It's unknown whether Johnson can get enough votes to pass the bill in the House and the Democratic-controlled Senate in time to avoid a shutdown. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us on this now. Hey, Ali, good morning. So how does this work? Walk us through these extensions, those dates, and also, I mean, is there any chance this is going to happen? Does the votes, are the votes there? It seems like they're probably there, but of course, you never know for sure until the gavel drops in the House chamber. We expect that vote to come as early as Tuesday as lawmakers head back to town. We saw Speaker Johnson release this plan over the weekend, trying to give his members 72 hours to read in on what he's proposing. But you're right. They're calling this a laddered continuing resolution. It's kind of more like a step stool, though, because there's really only two tiers to it. There's that January date that you point out, and then there's that later February. February date that you also mentioned, this is basically to allow two things. The first is so that Johnson can say that he's not just doing a clean continuing resolution, which is how Speaker Johnson became Speaker Johnson in the first place. That's what Kevin McCarthy did just a few months ago with the help of Democrats to avoid the last government shutdown. 
and get us to this current position. Johnson doesn't want to be in that same position. And so he's still pushing against the same budget hawks, the same people who want steep spending cuts within his conference. So he's trying to show that he can do something different, different while also not shutting down the government before holiday break. No one likes that, especially not lawmakers who'd like to be home with their families just like everyone else, but then also allowing it so that the Senate can't come in and, in his words, jam House Republicans into a deal that they don't want. This is a time-buying measure, and it's also something a little different than what McCarthy did. Hopefully that keeps Johnson out of hot water with his rightmost flank. We'll see. You mentioned jamming Democrats into something they don't want. How are they responding generally? Same with the White House to this. Look, they're not happy, but they're not so unhappy. And I think that that's really important here. House, Demo House Democrats have not been quick to knock this plan down. And I think that means that this is something that they could potentially get behind on the floor. That's something they're going to need because there are those same budget hawks within the House Republican flank who would like to see steeper spending cuts who do not want to get behind this. So you got to replace those votes somewhere. That's likely to come from the Democratic side. You got to watch how many Democrats, though, in the House actually come behind this. If it's too many, that could trigger the motion to vacate. We've been here before. I don't even want to get into it because it seems like we just got into this once before. But here we are. And on the Senate side, we're going to watch them move a vehicle to pass whatever it takes to avoid a government shutdown sometime tonight. But it seems like this could be something that they get behind, even just to buy themselves time to do this battle, not now, but early next year instead. I'm trying to think of something I'm going to describe to my husband as well. I'm not happy, but I'm not so unhappy because it's hilarious that that's the <laughs> state so of things. There's a difference. Right now. <laughs> there is a difference. And it's just like, so it's just craziness. Um, Ali, let's switch gears really quickly to some 2024 election headlines while I have you. You are known on Instagram for making your list of people, crossing them out as they drop out. Well, Senator <laughs> Tim Scott announced last night that he's suspending his presidential campaign. And it seemed like it came as a shock to Republicans, including some of his own staff. What do we know about this? It definitely came as a shock to some of his own staff. This is something that, to the extent that it was known Scott was going to drop out late last night on a Fox News program, he didn't really tell staff ahead of time. And it's not clear that he's spoken to all of his staff since dropping out. You got to remember, there's people who pick up their lives and move to Charleston, South Carolina, move to Iowa, move to New Hampshire, all in the name of making someone president. So there's definitely a lot of hurt feelings that they were not at least spoken to about this decision. Nevertheless, Scott is someone who stumbled in debates, was never able to gain traction in those all important early states and announced last night on Fox News that he would be leaving the race. So yes, I get to go back to work and cross off another name from my primary Republican <laughs> list. You guys can all watch that, of course, on Instagram. But I think that this is not necessarily shocking, given the fact that Scott had been struggling, even just in the last few weeks. Savannah, he had told his staff, or rather his senior staff had told his staff, that they were going to be going all in on Iowa, shifting all of their campaign resources there. One of the super PACs that had been backing him pulled down all of their ads off the air a few weeks ago. Clearly, they had abandoned him. This makes sense, but it was surprising in the way that it yeah, happened. Absolutely. All right, Ali Vitali, thank you very much. Well, coming up, a new warning about fentanyl showing up in middle schools. The drastic action one district is now taking to help save the lives of its students. But first, with tensions rising in Taiwan, President Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping set to meet face to face. We're breaking down their high stakes meeting. Coming up next. Welcome back. President Biden will sit down with Chinese President Xi Jinping in a highly anticipated meeting on Wednesday. They're meeting on the sidelines of the APEC summit being held in San Francisco. It comes at a time when relations between the two countries are at their lowest point in decades. And U.S. officials have warned not to expect too much to change following this conversation. Joining us now is NBC News White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist. Aaron, always great to see you. Good morning. So this meeting comes in a year where we've really seen the fallout from quite a few diplomatic incidents. Everybody remembers the spy balloon, for example. But tell us, what is on the agenda for these two leaders? Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. Yeah, this, this meeting is actually APEC. The summit is uh, an economic summit. 21 countries from around the Pacific Rim, if you will, getting together for 
uh, conversations about their economies and how they can work together. But the main event, if you will, is going to be this meeting between President Biden and President Xi Jinping of China. Uh, you referenced the spy balloon incident. There have been other incidents involving aircraft, American aircraft, uh, and Chinese aircraft as well. There have been uh, issues around technology and uh, hacking concerns, all those things likely to be a part of the conversation that will happen between these two leaders. We also know from a senior administration official that there's going to be conversation about uh, the military to military disconnect that's happened over the last year or so. Uh, our two militaries haven't been engaging in a way that they typically would in order to minimize any potential for conflict. And of course, Savannah, there's going to be a part of the conversation that focuses on human rights, as is typically the case uh, when President Biden speaks mm -hmm. with the Chinese leader. So, and this will be the first meeting for these two since last year, and it's also President Xi's first trip to the U.S. in six years. I know they're setting expectations low, but I mean, are there any hopes that this meeting will reset their relationship, especially with sort of that different backdrop of him actually coming here and being in the U.S.? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, the, the senior administration officials that uh, have spoken to the media to sort of preview this meeting have indicated that we shouldn't expect a long list of deliverables, as it were, uh, anything that's going to come out of this meeting that is a change in policy. But the fact that this meeting is happening really is a significant step in trying to repair relations that have been really frayed between the two countries for some time now. The National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, was on several of the uh, Sunday morning talk shows and addressed this meeting between the two leaders and said that uh, really the point here is to try to manage the competition between the U.S. and China to avoid some sort of a conflict. I want you to hear a little bit more of what Sullivan had to say on CNN. And he's looking for areas where we can work together, where it's in our mutual interest to do so. When it comes to managing the relationship, ties and communications between our two militaries are critical. The Chinese have basically severed those communication links. President Biden would like to reestablish them, and he will look to this summit as an opportunity to try to advance the ball on that. Now, listen, this is a president who prides himself on what he can do when he can sit down face to face with somebody with whom he potentially has had disagreements uh, and can have a, a conversation that is matter of fact and detailed. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll see that the outcome of this is that uh, communication resumes on some level between high, high ranking officials in our two governments. All right, Aaron Gilchrist, thank you very much for your reporting here. Now let's head over to the UK where things are shaken up on Downing Street with the surprising return of a familiar face in British politics. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has the latest on that and some other world headlines. Hey Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. That's right. David Cameron is making a shocking return to British politics as foreign minister. Now, you may remember the former UK prime minister left politics in 2016 after losing the Brexit referendum. But just this morning, the current prime minister, Rishi Sunak, appointed Cameron after firing Suella Braverman. Cameron, Cam Cameron's controversial return is highly unexpected, catching British politicians and us by surprise. Now let's travel over to France, where over 100,000 people are protesting against anti-Semitism. Demonstrators in uh, cities across France took to the streets just yesterday in solidarity with Jews across the country. Anti-Semitic incidents have multiplied since Hamas's attack on Israel a little over a month ago and the ongoing war in Gaza. The marches were called by the leaders of the French parliament, the Senate and the National Assembly. This also comes as tensions in the country continue to rise, particularly in Paris, which is home to a high population of both Jewish and Muslim communities as fighting continues between, between Israel and Hamas. Now we end our tour with a party in India. Millions hit the streets for Diwali over the weekend. It's a Hindu festival celebrating light over darkness. And it was bright indeed. So bright that India actually broke a Guinness World Record for the number of bright earth oil lamps by burning over 2 million of them in 45 minutes. But these dazzling lights for of colorful decorations turn, took a dark turn, raising new concerns over air quality in the South Asian country. Just last week, New Delhi shut down schools over severe pollution, and now worries are jumping to new heights after a weekend filled with fireworks left the country covered in smoke. Mm. Savannah? All right, Claudio, thank you very much.
Well, most of the country is prepping for a wet week ahead. Let's get a closer look with your morning news now weather and meteorologist Michelle Grossman, who's in studio with us. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, Savannah. Great to see you. Yeah, we do have some soggy start spots to start this week. We're looking at very soggy conditions in portions of the south central states. Also, the Pacific Northwest, we have an atmospheric river that's setting up, and that's going to bring some mountain snow, some lower elevation rain to parts of the west coast. Starting in the south, though, you can see all this moisture moving on shore. It's coming from the Gulf. It's kind of riding along a stalled front. So it's moving very slowly, but you can see those brighter colors. That's where that heavy rain is falling, and we're going to continue to see this. Now, this is good news. We are in a drought in this area, but still we could see some localized flooding as we go throughout today. Now, the system's going to move off to the east, but for today, we're looking at Texas, uh, southern Mississippi for some heavy rain, and then it'll move slowly, riding along the Gulf Coast. So tomorrow, we're going to see another wet day, and that's mainly from Alabama to Florida, Georgia, also looking at the chance for isolated flash flooding as well, because you can see those darker colors. Could even see a few thunderstorms too because this system has a lot of energy that's coming off the Gulf. Now locally we could see five inches or greater but generally it could be one to three inches. Lesser amounts as you go to the lighter green and yellows, reds, oranges. That's where we're going to see the most amount of rain. So along the coast here especially, especially in Louisiana into parts of Alabama as well. Now look at the drought though. We're looking at Louisiana. 99% of the state is in a drought. 100% of the state is in a drought in Mississippi. So this is relief. This is good news. This is beneficial. We need it but it's coming quickly and there's a lot of it so we could see some localized flooding that's a major weather story for today otherwise we're very quiet across the country we're looking at well above normal temperatures throughout portions of the rockies into the plains also into parts of the southeast as well but it's the pacific northwest we're watching that atmospheric river we've heard so many of them this year and that really helped to drop the drought there we were in a drought just a year ago now zero percent of california is is in a drought. that's due to the atmospheric rivers we're going to see it once again with that heavy mountain snow the lower elevation rain then by Friday, we're going to see some showers back into the mid-Atlantic, parts of the Carolinas, and also the uh, New England and the Southwest are going to be wet as well. So looking ahead towards that atmospheric low, the atmospheric, atmospheric river, that area of low pressure, that is moving on shore. It's bringing periods of rain. It's bringing some snow. And this, again, is really good news. They were in a dire situation mm. just a year ago and now looking good. But still, we're not used to rain in this area. So we're going to watch. So we go much of it, too. Yeah. And by the way, if it's the weekend in New York, it's raining. Always. I know. All right. Michelle Grossman, thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Coming up, fighting back the steps one school district is being forced to take to keep its students safe from fentanyl. That is up next. Welcome back. The University of Houston is mourning the loss of three former football players, including longtime NFL player DJ Hayden. The men were among six people killed in a horrific car crash that took place just hours before their school's annual homecoming game over the weekend. NBC's Priscilla Thompson has more. Grief on the gridiron. University of Houston fans pausing their homecoming game for a moment of silence in honor of three former football players killed in a car crash hours before kickoff. You know, sad day to be a Coug. Whether you knew them or whether you didn't know them, they're Cougs, they're family. Police say the men were riding in this SUV around 2 a.m. Saturday morning when another driver slammed into them. The other vehicle ran a red light, appears to be going very fast, high velocity. Six people were killed, U of H confirming ex-players DJ Hayden, Zachary McMillan, and Ralph Aragwu. Former teammates and coaches also remembering the football trio as amazing young men with infectious smiles and laughter that lit up every moment. What will you remember most about them? Just showing the most absolute genuine love. Zach would know everybody in the building's name down to the janitor. And, and I, I speak that in the same way about Ralph. You know, just another guy showed nothing but, but love. Cameron Oliver played at U of H and knew all three. DJ was very, he was loved by everybody. Being that guy who, who, who you can look to as an example. Hayden, a Houston area native, survived a near fatal heart injury in his senior year at U of H before going on to become a first round draft pick by the Oakland Raiders in 2013. He played nine seasons with the NFL in Oakland, Detroit, Jacksonville, and Washington. Our thanks to Priscilla Thompson for that report. Well, the Raiders put out a statement remembering Hayden for his, quote, courage, perseverance, and dedication to his teammates.
Now let's get to the ongoing fentanyl crisis here in our country. More young people, even as young as middle schoolers, are accidentally being poisoned by pills containing fentanyl. The issue has become such a challenge for one community that the school district is now taking steps to teach parents how to save children from an overdose. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky has the details. Sometime after 9 o'clock, he took the pill that took his life. Alexander Neville died of fentanyl poisoning in 2020. The California teen was 14 years old, just barely out of middle school. You feel like a complete failure, right? You're, we're beating ourselves up over it all the time. His mother, Amy, confessing she didn't even know what fentanyl was. Death blindsided us. Uh, no one was talking about fentanyl at the time. According to Amy, her teenage son thought he was taking oxycodone. But a toxicology report later revealed that one fatal pill was laced with fentanyl. It was a life or death situation, and I didn't realize that. A threat that's now made its way to Cleveland, Texas. There's no cap. A sobering show and tell at a middle school. Ready? That's it. You just saved a life. In a cafeteria where kids eat lunch, parents learning how to use Narcan to potentially save their own child from fentanyl poisoning. It's incomprehensible. Onelia Santos here for her three kids and free Narcan. At first, I was like, no, because let's not have this because it's going to give a gateway for these children to go ahead and say, hey, there's something to save me. Let's just try it anyway. And now? And now we need it. That's because parents here are facing something they've never seen before, an explosion of opioid-related incidents. Barely three months into the school year, the district's reported 15 EMT calls, eight overdoses, none of them fatal, but four needing Narcan and even an arrest at one of the middle schools for possession of opioids. If anything were to happen to one of these students, our district would completely feel it. With two high schoolers of her own, the fight is personal for district nursing director Lacey Green, who rebuilt campus first aid kits, equipped with a life-saving drug. If it's a situation that they need to give Narcan in, they already have it on them. So that's Now Narcan kits are at every campus in the district, even the elementary schools. Junior Leslie Gonzalez and senior Valeria Trevino say the difference from last year to now, dramatic. Not just in overdoses, but in access to drugs like Percocet, often unknowingly laced with the fatal drug. How easy are these drugs to come by? Very easy. How easy? To the point where you could look at someone in your class and you could ask and they would have. Texas has seen fentanyl-related deaths surge 600% in just three years. More than 200 of those deaths involving people 18 and under. What's happened since the pandemic with youth is a skyrocketing uh, national epidemic of crushing anxiety that makes these kids not want to come to school. Which is what drives Dr. Joy Alonzo to come to town halls like Cleveland's. This is Texas to Tennessee, Baltimore to Los Angeles. No one is spared. It's hard because I just want my kid. A painful reality, one Amy Neville wishes she could rewind every single day. A little bit of information would have gone a long way in our house that night, and unfortunately we didn't have that, and we paid the price. Morgan Chesky, NBC News, Cleveland, Texas. Just heartbreaking. Well, coming up, could those popular weight loss drugs help reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes? We are digging into the findings of a brand new study. That is coming up next. We are back with new groundbreaking research that experts say shows more benefits of those weight loss drugs that we keep talking about. A new study released over the weekend found that an ingredient in the popular medication Wagovi could reduce the risk of heart attacks in obese adults with heart disease. And as NBC's Liz Kreutz reports, this could change the course of treatment for patients. As the weight loss drug revolution explodes nationwide, new research shows the medications may not only help patients shed pounds, but also improve heart health. A recent clinical trial shows semaglutide, the active ingredient in popular weight loss drugs Wagovi and Ozempic, could reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes by 20 percent. So highly significant. Dr. Michael Linkoff is the lead author of the trial, which followed 17,000 obese adults 45 and older who had pre-existing cardiovascular disease but were not diabetic. Of the participants, 8% who received a placebo had a heart attack or stroke, compared to 6.5% who took Wagovi. 
up until now, no one has shown in, in any group of patients with overweight and obesity that the risk of cardiovascular events could be reduced. The findings of the study, funded by Novo Nordisk, the maker of Wagovi, come as the FDA approves a new version of diabetes drug Manjaro for weight loss called Zepbound. New research shows the active ingredient in that drug, terzepatide, may help type 2 diabetes patients reduce inflammation, which may lower the risk of heart disease. Manjaro changed my life. 30-year-old Alexis Mitchell has been taking Manjaro for just over a year now and says she's lost 125 pounds. I don't want to wait until I have a heart attack. I don't want to wait until I have a stroke. But despite the promise of these drugs, all the side effects are not fully known. This is not meant for the person who sort of wants to casually lose 5, 10 pounds, you know, before a big event. We don't actually think it's worth taking some of the risks, some of which are known, some of which are unknown. And these drugs aren't cheap, as much as $1,300 a month, and most health care plans don't cover them. But experts say these findings could push insurance companies to do so. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. Liz, thank you so much. Well, let's bring in NBC News medical analyst, Dr. Ben Gupta, for more on this. Dr. Gupta, thanks very much for being here. So as we just heard there from Liz, I mean, it found that this active ingredient could reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes by up to 20 percent. That sounds pretty significant. Walk us through your takeaways from this study. Yes, Savannah, good morning. We, we haven't had this type of risk reduction in patients that already have heart disease or are on a medication like a statin because they're at high risk. And so this is really an additive value medication that previously hasn't existed. And we've seen other medications that promise significant weight loss, Savannah, like Orlistat, things that have been available on the market for a while. While they may help people lose weight, they don't reduce the risk of heart disease. That's where this is really breaking new ground, and it's an extraordinary finding. I want to pull up a stat. According to research from Harvard School of Public Health, 69% of U.S. adults are overweight or obese. Uh, walk us through the connection here, because obviously this big headline is what this can do for your heart health. So walk us through how losing weight can improve heart health. And I understand what you're saying is that this medication kind of even takes that a step further. But what's that link there? You know, often what we see is that if you're overweight, your risk for diabetes for high cholesterol, basically risk factors, Savannah, to clog the arteries around your heart is quite high, even if you're overweight, but not quite obese, that that, that risk, that correlation is very high. And so that's where we're seeing over 100 million American adults are overweight or obese, that these drugs have the potential to lower the risk of heart disease because they're gonna help you lose weight. So that losing the weight component is gonna be critical, but a lot of these individuals are also at high risk for developing diabetes, have, have blood sugar control that's not optimal, Again, it's going to help bring that into control as well. And as you pointed out, inflammation, there is this belief here that these drugs can lower inflammation overall in the body. And that's what's also unique here. Blood sugar control, loss of weight and reduction in inflammation that protects the arteries around the heart. That's why we're seeing these findings that were released over the weekend. Dr. Gupta, right now, a lot of these medications are quite expensive and a lot of them are not covered under insurance if you're not using them for diabetes specifically. But experts say that these new findings and as we find out more things that they can be doing for somebody's health, that could change, right? Walk us through that. I hope so. You know, what we're seeing is the list price for these medications, Savannah, is over $1,000. Same exact medication in Japan, less than $200 for the same monthly supply. There's a big gap here in how these medications are priced specifically in the U.S. market. Insurance programs like Medicare Medicaid are not covering it. Um, I, I suspect what's going to happen here, the next 12 months, you're going to see more medications in this category uh, move into the oral formulation. They're less, they're less expensive to produce, less difficult to manage. That's going to bring down the price here. But there's going to have to be some sort of reckoning here with the price. Will the manufacturers, the pharmaceutical companies, start to lower the cost of these drugs? Because insurance companies right now at scale are unable to actually cover these medications for as many people as need them at such an expensive list price. Again, critically, we charge five times as much as what these medications are priced at in the United Kingdom or in Japan. Mm. That's got to change. Interesting stuff and hopefully some promising stuff there. Dr. Vin Gupta, thank you very much for joining us on this. Let's get you some financial headlines now, starting with a breakthrough for Boeing in China. CNBC's Pippa Stevens has that story and other headlines for us. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Well, China may be close to lifting a commercial freeze on Boeing 737 MAX jet. 
Bloomberg reports an announcement could come at this week's APEC summit in San Francisco, where President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping are set to meet. Boeing hasn't logged any major sales of the MAX in China since 2018. The jet was grounded worldwide for nearly two years following two deadly crashes in 2018 and 2019. The Marvels is a box office letdown for Disney, bringing in an estimated $47 million in its opening weekend, according to Comscore. That is the smallest debut for any movie in the so-called Marvel Cinematic Universe. Only two others have opened to less than $60 million, The Incredible Hulk in 2008 and Ant-Man in 2015. This latest result could illustrate a problem that Disney CEO Bob Iger pointed to during the company's earnings report last week, saying Disney is making too much content and isn't focusing enough on quality. And Small Business Saturday may be more popular than Black Friday. A new bank rate survey finds more than 60% of holiday shoppers say they are likely to shop on Small Business Saturday this year, while 56% will be out and about on Black Friday. But Cyber Monday comes out on top overall, with two-thirds of people likely to shop then. Nearly three-quarters of consumers plan to shop at a small business at some point this season. A majority of people believe small businesses are a better experience than large stores, offering unique gift ideas and better customer service. Savannah, Ooh, back to interesting. you. Interesting. All right, Peppa Stevens, thank you so much. Well, coming up, the most wonderful time of the year is here, and so is the world's most famous Christmas tree. Really, it's right here. Up next, we're talking to the man who's in charge of finding the Rockefeller Center tree and asking him what goes into that selection process. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas here at Rockefeller Center with the arrival of this year's Christmas tree. As you can see, New York City's symbol of the season was driven in, hoisted by a crane, and placed in position where it will stay for the holidays. The Norway spruce was driven down from upstate New York, and it arrived in Manhattan Saturday morning. It's estimated to be around 80 years old, stands 80 feet tall, and we just love her. Joining us now is the man behind the holiday magic who has helped pick the tree for the past three decades, Eric Pazza. He is the head gardener at Rockefeller Center. Eric, good morning. Good morning. Does it feel like that? It's been three decades of this tree for you? No, nah, not at all. <laughs> Too much fun. Oh my God, I love, I love, we've had this conversation before. I love how much you love this. So first, let's just talk about how you became the go-to person for this task. Uh, well, I started back in 1988 and uh, just slowly worked my way up. 1995, I became the head gardener, and then I started looking for the tree. Do you remember the first tree you picked? Sure, I do. I remember all of them. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so what's this process like? How do you find the tree? Well, with this tree, I, I went up to see another tree um, and decided to stay around town overnight. I came back, and uh, the next day I saw that tree, and I decided to drive around a little bit and then came back this year and uh, decided to knock on the door. Wow, that's so funny. And what's it usually like when you knock on the door? So what, what do you say? Pretend you're knocking on my door. <laughs> well, first I introduce myself as uh, Eric uh, Pose and then slowly get into the head gardener at Rockefeller Center and, and then turn to the Christmas tree talk and ask if I could take a few pictures. And what's the reaction normally? Normally it's like a little hesitation, like, <laughs> okay, you're the Christmas tree, but then as I start talking to them, they get all excited. <laughs> Do people submit their trees? Are they like, hey, come use ours? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's submittals uh, online, and then there's ones where I drive around and find them. Has there ever been a year where it's been tough to find one? No, luckily, there's a lot of great trees and a lot of great families that are willing to donate the trees. Do you kind of almost have like a backlog in your head of like, oh, that was a good one, that might be a good one in a few years? Yeah, if I can remember them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody helping you out with this? Sure, there's a lot of great people that are involved with the Christmas tree process. Yeah. Has anybody ever said, no, we don't want you to chop our tree down? No, everybody, once you start getting into it and talking to them about how it's going to make a lot of people happy, everybody gets excited. <laughs> oh, that's pretty amazing that there's never been a no. Okay, so now she's here. She just got hoisted up, put in position. I always think it's interesting how m much we see kind of getting chopped off as it's getting, like, trimmed and pruned, I guess. But walk us through what's happening right now. Well, this morning we're going to uh, get ready to put the star on on Wednesday. So we have a crane out there now. We're going to put a pipe down the center of the tree that can hold up the 900-pound Swarovski star. And then the electricians are up there and the engineers are up there and the carpenters are up there. Everybody has their little task in the tree and is 
any time, there could be about 30, 35 people working in a tree. Wow. And so tell us about how you light this tree, how many lights it takes, and how you get those all on there. Sure. By the time we're done, we'll probably have about 50,000 lights. Uh, it'll take a week and a half to get it ready. Uh, then the scaffold comes down, and then NBC moves in and gets ready for the tree lighting. Wow. Okay, so this is a live shot, actually, that viewers see on their screen right now. So walk us through what we see. I can see, obviously, some people on the top couple levels. What are they doing? Yeah, well, there's a crane behind. You might catch the glimpse of the grain in the back there. That's going to lift up the oh, pipe. Yeah. And then right down the center of the tree, we're going to put that pipe. Yeah, explain the pipe. Well, it's... the pipe is, uh, because the star is 900 pounds, the pipe goes right down next to the trunk. We attach it to the trunk, secure it. And then we put the star in on Wednesday. Wow. Also, for anybody, obviously, you pick the most famous tree in the world every year. She's beautiful. What should people think about when they're picking their trees at home? Well, that's the same thing I do with the Rockefeller Center tree. I want one that looks good in the house. It's going to look good in your living room or your family room. It's something you would want in your place. Wow. Do you love when it's here? Oh, I love it. I love this time of the year. It's uh -huh. great. Me too. Eric Pose, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for picking our tree for our backyard every year. We all love it. We're so Thank lucky to have it. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Well, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but the news continues right now. Stay with us. Thank you for joining us on a Monday. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe's off today. Right now on Morning News Now, escalating violence in the Middle East this morning after U.S. defense officials confirmed another round of retaliatory airstrikes on Iranian-linked sites in Syria over the weekend. It comes as a key hospital in Gaza faces a growing humanitarian crisis with power and resources scarce. Local health officials say dozens of newborns could face death quote, at any moment. We will bring you the latest from the ground and how the fighting is raising security concerns here at home. Uncertainty in Washington this morning as the federal government once again hurdles toward a new deadline to keep the lights on. We'll dig deeper into the House GOP's two-part plan to avoid another shutdown that's set for Friday and why some are saying it's more trouble than it's worth. Plus, how might gridlock in Washington affect what's projected to be the busiest holiday travel season on record? We'll talk to the head of the TSA in just a moment. And we are once again on Taylor Watch with the curtains just opening a little further over the weekend on her viral yet somehow super secretive relationship with the Chiefs, Travis Kelsey. I don't think it's so secret anymore. Not after what we saw this weekend. And I'm always on Taylor Watch, so we will certainly keep you posted on that. We begin this morning, though, with the unfolding humanitarian disaster in Gaza as Israel continues its aerial and ground attack on the Palestinian enclave. The World Health Organization says Gaza's biggest hospital has stopped functioning amid an ongoing Israeli assault that has left the facility without power or water. Doctors inside the Al-Shifa hospital have told NBC News that 36 newborn babies are at risk of dying after being taken off incubators while hundreds more people remain trapped inside. It comes as the threat of a broad regional escalation intensified over the weekend after the Pentagon said it again carried out strikes on Iranian-backed groups in Syria. We have a team standing by to discuss this, but we start off things in Tel Aviv with NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons. Keir, good morning. Hey there, good day to you. The World Health Organization now says that half of the hospitals in Gaza are out of action. Among the lives at risk now, a group of premature babies who are, of course, some of the hardest patients to move. Meanwhile, we're learning that a three-year-old Israeli-American child is among the hostages. Born into a war, now surrounding their hospital called Al-Shifa, 36 babies in a neonatal unit where the power is failing, doctors told us by phone. I'm afraid that the babies, they are going to die. Three died over the weekend, he says. After heavy explosions at Al-Shifa Friday, the U.S. warned against firefights in hospitals. Israel saying it is trying to evacuate patients, but giving few details. Releasing images of Israeli soldiers leaving fuel for generators, but only 300 litres, 80 gallons. Al-Shifa is the biggest hospital in Gaza. Doctors denying Israeli assertions that under Al-Shifa is a Hamas headquarters. But a decade ago, Amnesty International reported Hamas torturing people in the outpatients unit. Hundreds of thousands are fleeing through Israel's humanitarian corridors. But if they cannot return home, Palestinians say it will be another catastrophe in their history, or Nakba. 
This weekend, an Israeli minister suggesting that's what will happen, igniting condemnation. But the hostages taken by Hamas aren't home either. Yesterday, the White House revealing that one American being held is just three years old, the parents killed by Hamas. Or Levy is one of the 239 hostages, his wife, one of 1,200 murdered, the family now caring for their two-year-old child, hoping he still has a father. He's calling for his mother and his father all the time. He wants to go home all the time. This is the last video of the couple together, hiding in a shelter. For now, the family haven't told their son what happened. He's only two. I mean, he'll, and he's already lost his mother. He needs his dad back. Exactly, he needs his dad. The UN says the Hamas terror attacks and continued holding of hostages is a war crime. It has also accused Israel of war crimes through the collective punishment of civilians. Over 11,000 are now dead, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, which is run by Hamas. The main difference is, are you deliberately targeting civilians? No, we're deliberately doing everything, everything in our power to target the terrorists. And the Israeli Prime Minister telling Kristen Welker that Israel knows, quote, a great deal about where the hostages are and suggesting there could be a breakthrough in those talks. A diplomat with knowledge of those talks are telling us that there are multiple hurdles ahead, but that the parameters of a deal are in place. All right, Kira, thank you very much. Let's bring in Rob D'Amico for more on the hostage negotiations. He is the founder of Sierra One Consulting and a former member of the FBI's hostage rescue team. Rob, good morning. Thank you very much for being with us. So Prime Minister Netanyahu sat down with our own Kristen Walker to discuss this ongoing situation. Let's take a listen to what he had to say in that. So is there a potential the deal, pressure. Mr. Prime Minister? Is there a potential there, deal? There could, there could be, but I think the less I say about it, the more I'll increase the chances that it materializes. And it's a result of pressure military pressure, the extraordinary work that uh, the IDF is doing, putting pressure on the Hamas leadership, that's the one thing that might uh, create a deal. And if a deal is available, well, we'll talk about it uh, when it's there. We'll announce it if it's achieved. What do you make of those comments about military offenses being the key to negotiations for hostages? Well, I have, I have two takes from that. One is uh, the prime minister is a politician. Um, Two things in that comment. One, he could he's biased. He wants that decision he made to be right. So he could have been told something counter to that, but he still wants to believe it's correct. Or two, he might know it's not correct, but he wants others to believe it. So you have to really kind of gauge that conversation that he's having. There's a purpose to it. If he if he didn't want to say anything about it, he wouldn't have. So but you also have to look at we're not going to understand if that's even a right decision based on Hamas's uh, reasons that they took the hostages. They took them purposely, and they actually knew what is Israel's reaction to this whole operation was going to be. So you have to kind of play it in there. Like, uh, bin Laden's goal at the time wasn't to do anything except for uh, have the o U.S. overreact and then form a caliphate to, to rise up against the U.S. I think Hamas took these hostages knowing that what Israel was going to do uh, to bring it to attention of the U.S. So Hamas may have wanted them to do the ground assault because they get better in the information war that's going on right now. So I don't think he can say that uh, truthfully and understand it might be that Hamas wanted that ground war to go on. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan also commented on these negotiations and gave more insight into how many Americans are being held, as we were mentioning just a moment ago, we heard in our colleagues report. First, let's listen to a little bit of what he had to say. And the goal here is to do what is necessary at the negotiating table to ensure that we get the safe return of all of the hostages, including the Americans. And uh, we currently have nine Americans who are missing, one green card holder who is missing. We don't know the status, uh, whether they are alive or whether they have passed away, but we are looking to get the safe recovery of all of those individuals and we're staying in close touch with their families. In fact, I'll be meeting with the families of the American hostages this week. So let's talk through what the U.S. has to offer in this situation. I guess does U.S. allyship for Israel help or hurt the chances of seeing those Americans come home? It helps. It helps. It, it, though when you get these many players in a negotiation because uh, Qatar's in there, uh, America's in there, 
it does complicate things because there's so many people in, uh, involved in what messages are getting to each side. You don't even know uh, if Hamas is having a conversation with the Qataris and we're talking to the Qataris and the Qataris are talking back to us and we're talking to Israel. That gets very complicated. But the more players you have in there, the more possibility of side deals Israel may not even know. I did a hostage negotiation uh, in uh, working with the Canadians for Canadian citizens to be released and the Qataris involved. Um, we thought it was a straight up deal. And then about three days after we got the, the Canadian person back, um, there was like 30 uh, Afghan prisoners released back into uh, Taliban. So I think there was a side deal that no one knew about. Mm. And I think that's the same thing here. Hamas is probably having a side deal with the Qataris. We're having a side deal with, with everybody in order to get what we want. And Israel might not even understand what the true uh, negotiations uh, played out because you might not see it. Are you hopeful that a deal can be reached now? I mean, especially now that we're over a month out from the start of this war, what needs to happen here in order for Hamas to release most or, of course, hopefully, if not all of the hostages? How would you try to persuade them? I am hopeful. I'm hopeful because they took them, again, they took them for a reason. Uh, it, it wasn't just ad hoc. So when they get to what they want, and hopefully they will through this, uh, that release will come about. So you have to really look at it. It's going to be complex, but they have to be uh, in a position to get at least the majority of what they're looking for in taking them uh, to release them. Rob D'Amico, as always, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thousands of people across the country took to the streets this weekend to call for a ceasefire in this war. But the growing tensions between pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian demonstrations have law enforcement officials on edge. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us now from Miami, Florida, with the latest on these protests. Sam, good morning. Now, yeah, Savannah, good morning. As the war rages on abroad here at home, we are just seeing more protests, more threats to public safety. Savannah, that did include a bomb scare over the weekend in New York City. And also here in Miami Beach, there were competing protests on famed Ocean Drive, which, you know, is typically, Savannah, a place for recreation and dining. Instead, it was the backdrop for this protest. And police said it was largely peaceful. There were no arrests, but that was a very sensitive dynamic. And there was also video capturing a woman doing something so cruel that it fanned concerns all over the country. As fighting escalates in Gaza, protests growing here in the U.S. Over the weekend, crowds calling for a ceasefire in cities nationwide, from Austin to Boston. What we're seeing now is people demanding an end to our government's complicity in this genocide. In New York, a pro-Palestinian rally Friday night, forcing authorities to temporarily close down Grand Central Terminal. There was also a bomb threat the next day at a Manhattan synagogue, though police searched the area and found no signs of any threats. Some rallies turning contentious. What are you watching, TikTok? Is that where you get your history? On either side of Miami's famed Ocean Drive, pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel groups held dueling demonstrations. I'm fighting for my country. We got to fight for our right to live in freedom. At the same protest in Miami, this cell phone video shared with NBC News and now seen by millions on social media, a hateful outburst by a woman pushing a stroller. Hitler should have finished the job. He knew what the it comes amidst the backdrop of a global outcry against the rise in attacks against Jewish people as the fighting rages in the Mideast. In France, massive crowds gathering Sunday to protest anti-Semitism and similar concerns on America's college campuses. At Ohio State, investigators are looking into the assaults of two students and vandalism at the school's Jewish center, which the university's president says directly targeted our Jewish community. It's a challenging time to be a Jewish college student on campus right now. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressing the protests on Meet the Press. They understand that we're fighting the just battle of civilization against barbarism. But those who, uh, those who protest for Hamas, you're protesting for sheer evil. And Savannah, it is important to note as we see all of these threats continuing on college campuses that the Council on Islamic American Relations Care says there have been somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 plus requests for help or reports of bias. That is just from October the 7th through November 4th. Mm -hmm.
Savannah. Um, all right, Sam Brock, thank you very much. Well, the Pentagon said it again carried out airstrikes against Iranian facilities in Syria on Sunday. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said it was in response to a series of attacks on U.S. forces in Syria and Iraq. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from the White House on this. Hey, Gabe, good morning. So what can you tell us about these latest U.S. airstrikes? What has the defense secretary said so far? Uh, hey there, Savannah. Good morning. Yes, this is another sign of how this conflict could be spreading with U.S. soldiers getting more and more involved. Overnight, U.S. forces conducted that new round of airstrikes in eastern Syria, targeting a training facility and a safe house. The Pentagon says they were being used by Iran and its affiliated groups. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin says the strikes are in direct response to continued attacks against U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria. And there have been at least 47 attacks against military bases with U.S. troops since October 17th. But this time, there are more questions about how Iran might respond. A U.K.-based group reports eight pro-Iranian militants were killed in this airstrike, though the Pentagon has not confirmed that number, Savannah. Gabe, okay, we're also monitoring the aftermath of this U.S. military helicopter crash in the Mediterranean Sea during a training exercise. What are we learning there? Uh, yeah, Savannah, this uh, happened on Friday. Um, this, uh, the Pentagon is saying that five U.S. service members were killed in a helicopter accident off the coast of Cyprus after their helicopter crashed into the Mediterranean Sea. And the group was part of a refueling training mission. And we're just getting pictures of some of those service members that were killed. They range in age from 24 to 38 years old. And some of these special uh, military operation units were brought to the region. Um, and officials say this helicopter was on a route routine training mission not involved in any operation related to Israel. But again, we're just learning more information about those service members. Heartbreaking for their families this morning, Savannah. All right, Gabe, thank you very much. Well, turning now to New York, where FBI officials are investigating whether Mayor Eric Adams played a role in expediting a Turkish consulate building project in Manhattan. According to sources who spoke with our New York station, WNBC, Adams reached out to the fire department commissioner shortly after he won the Democratic bid for mayor in 2021. Two sources familiar with the matter told WNBC that Adams asked the commissioner to review outstanding fire safety and occupancy permit issues. These conversations came to light during a larger ongoing FBI investigation into Adams' 2021 mayoral campaign. In a statement, Adams said, quote, as a borough president, part of my routine role was to notify government agencies of issues on behalf of constituents and constituencies. I have not been accused of wrongdoing and I will continue to cooperate with investigators. Well, Congress is up against the wire again to get a spending plan passed before the Friday deadline. The House plans to vote on a short-term funding bill to avoid that government shutdown as early as tomorrow, but it's unknown whether Republicans have the votes to get it passed. NBC News Senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig joins us now from Washington. Hey, Garrett, good morning. So Republicans are, are taking this two-tiered approach as opposed to a more typical funding plan that covers the entire federal government kind of extending some of these dates. So what is in this spending plan and what was left out? Yes, look, Savannah, this is a problem we're used to, but the solution here is a novel one, and some would argue an overly complex one. The idea here is to split up a short-term extension of government funding to get us at least through the holidays and buy more time to, to produce a year-long plan, but basically by splitting it up. So one of the deadlines will come for some sections of the government in January. The rest of the government will run out of money in February. It divides this problem in two. What makes it possible that this will pass, <coughs> excuse me, is that it doesn't include any other extraneous measures. There's no budget cuts. There's no weird policy changes in here. But there's also not Ukraine aid, Israel aid, Taiwan aid, border aid. It's pretty simple and straightforward other than this weird two-tier system, which I think gives it some hopes that this could make it through both chambers this week. Yeah, well, I know we're expecting a vote as early as tomorrow, as I mentioned. Is there a clear path in the House to get this short-term spending bill passed? Yeah, look, I mean, we've heard from a couple of far-right Republicans, three so far, who've said they definitely won't vote for this. I think there's probably more kind of hiding out somewhere who are opposed to it. The only way this passes, and the only way it becomes law, is if Democrats are willing to support it, because he would have to pass the Senate, too. And I think that's a possibility. Democrats spent the weekend kind of trashing this idea, making fun of it, saying it's overly complicated and it doesn't need to be this way. But they didn't come right out and say they wouldn't vote for it. It, it is sort of silly with the two different deadlines 
Republicans. But if that's what it takes to get this through and avoid this kind of year end Christmas deadline or everybody's up on the hill till midnight on Christmas Eve, freaking out, uh, you know, about people not getting paychecks and not being able to go to work the next day. I think a lot of Democrats realize that's that's the better option, even if they think the process is wonky. Right. So that's what I'm looking for over the next couple of days. And Garrett, just put this in perspective for people at home. What's at stake for just the average American? What happens if Republicans can't get this passed before the Friday night deadline? Yeah, look, we've seen this show before. The first thing you'll notice is federal workers don't get paid. A lot of them will have to go to work without pay. Some will be furloughed. That includes people like your air traffic controllers and TSA agents. You don't want them not working around the holidays when people are trying to fly. It means active duty military won't get paychecks until the uh, until the shutdown is over. Again, not the kind of thing you want to see happen when there's multiple wars going on around the world that the United States is involved with, at least on the periphery. Now, for seniors, people who get Medicare checks, and things like that, that kind of service would continue. But it especially lined up against the end of the year, a shutdown could be an economic disaster for the country. And it's that that's going to be in the backs of the minds of all these lawmakers when they go to vote on this wonky plan this week. You know, the alternative is, is a pretty scary business. Yeah. All right, Garrett Haig, thank you very much. You bet. Well, Thanksgiving less than two weeks away. It means it's the beginning of the holiday travel season. It's just about to kick off. It comes here. It comes in a year where the TSA says numbers of people traveling around national holidays are up versus 2022 and have even risen above pre-pandemic levels. This all comes as the government braces for a possible shutdown, as we just heard from Garrett with that deadline of Friday. Let's bring in TSA Administrator David Pekoski for more on this. David, thank you very much for being here. Thank it's you. an honor to have you on set with Good us. Let's pick up right there with what Garrett was talking about, because actually we did see some TSA workers rallying against this looming shutdown and talking about how it would impact employees. How worried are you all? Well, it definitely will impact employees. And for TSA, 95 percent of our employees will work during a shutdown. But what happens is they work, uh, but they don't get paid. They don't get paid until a final appropriations bill or another continuing resolution that authorizes the pay is passed by the Congress, signed by the president. And so depending on how long a shutdown goes, it can right. have really significant impacts. Um, if you think back to 2019, when we had a 35-day government shutdown, yeah. towards the end of that, you know, a lot of our employees uh, had trouble um, paying for child care, uh, paying for gas, um, mm -hmm. getting um, to work, uh, paying for parking, so things like that that really have real-life impacts if you don't have steady income coming Absolutely. in. Absolutely. That was the longest and the most recent from 2018 right. into 2019, so mm -hmm. hopefully we don't see something like that again. Um, let's switch gears and talk about holiday travel. Mm -hmm. What are you expecting when it comes to Thanksgiving? Yeah. We, I, can't, I can't even believe it's less than two weeks. I really can't. When right. I just said that, I was like, is that right? Um, you think it's going to be record-breaking? I do, and, and really for us, Thanksgiving travel really begins on Friday, this Friday, uh, and runs all the way through um, the Tuesday following uh, Thanksgiving. Busiest days are always the, um, the Tuesday and Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and the very busiest day always is the Sunday following. And mm -hmm. for us, you know, we estimate that we could have upwards of 3 million passengers going through our screening checkpoints on that Sunday, which will be an all-time record for TSA. Wow, all-time yeah. all yeah. record. Ooh, okay, so we'll get to tips in just a minute for people mm -hmm. and how they should navigate that, but just I want to get through um, a few other kind of contextual questions. Obviously, we are seeing rising tensions around the world uh, all over the place. Um, TSA has also seen a rise in firearm detection people can see on their screen right now the agency recently announced that they expected to surpass last year's record what can you tell us about that rise in detection and as people do understand the backdrop just of the world right now how concerned should people be well as you saw 6542 firearms last year last year was an all-time record um, of those firearms 86% uh, were loaded um, this year we're already wow. at 5900 and so if you just straight line a projection to the end of this calendar year We'll probably be at 6,800 for this calendar year. Um, this year, a higher percentage loaded, about 93%. Um, and and you know, we assess significant penalties against individuals who bring a firearm into a checkpoint. Um, a pretty high numbers of detections. And you got to think of, you know, we, we're, we're thinking about holiday travel and, and think of the impact on a checkpoint operation when a passenger during a busy holiday travel period brings a firearm into the checkpoint. I mean, that takes that, that lane really out of commission for... 15, 20 minutes, and that just causes everybody to have to wait longer to say nothing of the obvious safety risks and security risks that are there. Absolutely. Um, also, it feels like when we kind of started to get back to travel, we were really seeing this incredibly high number of incidents of just simply bad behavior from people mm -hmm. in airports, on airplanes. Has that seemed to 
get under control? Are, are people behaving properly? Well, what happened, you know, when, when the mask mandate was in place, um, there were both verbal and physical assaults occurring uh, on aircraft. Yeah. And you saw them. You saw videos oh, that yeah. people had taken on board aircraft. Um, that was rare. Um, rarely happened before um, the pandemic occurred. When the mask mandate came off, um, the number of verbal assaults actually went down, uh, but the physical assaults actually stayed the same. And we've seen this steady level of physical assaults um, in airports and also in checkpoints. I think of the you know, TSA officers we have in checkpoints that um, don't expect to get assaulted by a passenger, yeah. but on occasion do. Um, so it's a significant problem. Uh, we work really closely with the FAA and the Department of Justice um, to address this. Don't expect and don't deserve to, by right. the way. I mean, it absolutely needs to change. Um, let's talk tips. Mm -hmm. When we hear record-breaking, we hear maybe TSA's yeah. highest day ever. You know, that just sounds like it's going to be tough to get through an airport. But what do you want people to keep in mind as they do travel? Well, I think the first thing is, given the record levels of travel, um, and, you know, I just came through an airport yesterday to come up here, uh, you got to think of the whole continuum of your travel. So there's going to be more traffic getting to the airport, particularly if you have a flight that takes off, like, between 5 in the morning and 8 in the morning. Okay. Or between, um, let's say, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So those are the busy periods, not just for airport travel, but for um, road travel getting right. to the airport. Uh, then parking lots are full, um, so it takes a little bit longer to get a parking space. Um, and uh, our checkpoints are going to be full of people. Um, so my best recommendation for folks this year is given the record numbers of travelers um, and given that we expect this holiday season to be a little bit longer um, because people are traveling earlier and staying longer um, to give themselves a little bit more time. That makes it easier. I mean, you're not anxious mm -hmm. about things. You're, you're not um, uh, really nervous about what might happen. Uh, just give yourself a little bit more time at work it that way. The other recommendation I'd make is, and we just talked about firearms, and so if you do have a firearm, double check. Make sure you don't have it in your carry-on bag. Mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can fly with a firearm, but you have to declare it to the airline and you have to put it in your check baggage, and it has to be properly stored. Um, so, you know, just think of that as well. And treat mm -hmm. The employees kindly. <laughs> Absolutely. This is Thanksgiving. And, and really think of all the employees that you're going to encounter, um, you know, TSA screening officers, um, other TSA personnel that are in and around the checkpoint or in and around the airport, making sure that everyone is safe and secure. Think of the gate agents. Think of the flight attendants. They're all working during this holiday. It's hard work. Um, everybody's on their feet for their entire shift. And so uh, give thanks good to the reminder. work that they're doing. Give thanks. thanks. Good. How are you guys with staffing levels? We're really good in staffing levels. We just had, fortunately, the, um, the president submitted the Congress passed uh, a bill last year for our appropriation that gave TSA employees for the first time in the agency's 22-year history the same pay scale as every other federal employee. Mm. Um, so once that passed and, and it was put into effect in July, uh, we saw our attrition rates go down wow. by about half. Mm. And uh, when we advertise for positions, we get a lot more applicants right now. Our big concern is to make sure that that pay gets continued fully for every employee into fiscal 24. And that's yeah. why this continuing resolution and eventually getting to the point where we have an appropriations bill is so important. Right. Absolutely. All right. TSA Administrator David Pekoski, thank, thank you. you very much for coming. Appreciate Happy it. Thanksgiving. Happy thank holidays. Same Happy travels. Thank you. <laughs> We've got a lot more ahead on this hour of morning news now, including the University of Idaho murders one year later. What's next for the suspected killer and how the victim's families are remembering their lost loved ones. But first, after the break, we'll take you to Iceland, where a potential volcanic eruption is prompting evacuations and emergency declarations. We've got it all up next. Welcome back. Iceland authorities have issued a state of emergency after hundreds of earthquakes shook the country over the weekend. Officials say the quakes are a grim sign that a volcanic eruption is imminent. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobea has the details. Well, this morning, an entire fishing village has been emptied out. It was evacuated over the weekend. The zone, the volcanic zone, is about 35 miles from the capital, Reykjavik, and the international airport. And scientists are warning an eruption could happen at any minute. <laughs> oh this morning, warning signs of a volcanic eruption. Thousands of earthquakes in an Icelandic fishing village. Massive cracks opening on the streets and in homes. A mile-long pool of lava below the town threatening to erupt. Local resident Gisli Gunnarsson and his girlfriend caught one of the strongest quakes on camera. This is a very big lava pocket and it goes straight under the town. So it, the town could just sort of 
disappear. Closing down the nearby Blue Lagoon, one of the country's most popular tourist destinations, and raising the aviation alert to orange. In 2010, an enormous ash cloud from the eruption of an ice-capped volcano grounded flights across Europe for weeks. The region, dormant for 800 years, came back to life in 2021, magma bursting to the surface again last year and this summer. What kind of an impact will that have, even a smaller eruption? We are looking at people losing their homes and particularly other critical infrastructure. There's a power plant. There's the Blue Lagoon. At the moment, the magma is so close to the surface um, that it could come up in a matter of potentially minutes. So it could happen in the next hours. It could happen in the next few days. We just don't know. The people from this fishing village watching and hoping their town survives. There's still a lot of uncertainty today, but even a small eruption could cause a lot of damage, according to scientists in Iceland. But they say it won't create an ash cloud like the one that grounded flights back in 2010. All right, Kelly Kobea, thank you so much. Now let's get a check on your morning news now weather with Michelle Grossman, who is back in studio with us with a look at the week ahead. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, Savannah. Well, we're looking pretty good straight ahead. We're looking at least the next couple of days relatively quiet for this time of year. We do have some soggy spots, but that is about it. We're looking to the south, the south central states, along the Gulf Coast states. We have a flood threat, not a widespread flood threat, but could see localized flooding because we're looking at quite a bit of rain there. This is beneficial rain. We're in a drought in this area, so it's good news, but in the meantime, Meantime, we could see some localized flooding. Notice we are dry for most of the country, well above normal temperatures throughout the Rockies, the Central Plains, into portions of the Midwest, the Ohio Valley. Back to the West, we're looking at an atmospheric river setting up. This is going to bring quite a bit of rain, also some mountain snow, not only today, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday along the West Coast. Uh, we're going to see anywhere from one to three inches of rain and some mountain snow and defeat. Uh, we're going to be measuring that as we go throughout time here. This is Wednesday. We're dry throughout the New England area, the Mid Atlantic, into the Carolinas. We're soggy with that storm moving to the east. So this is a very slow moving southern storm. It's going to move slowly and then we're going to see portions of the Gulf Coast states affected with some heavy rain. Still very warm throughout the Ohio Valley into the Midwest. Back to the Pacific Northwest. Notice all that heavy rain, the snow. That is that atmospheric river still in effect by Wednesday. And then as we go towards Friday, more rain into the southwest. We're looking at warm conditions uh, still in the middle of the country and then showers kind of expanding once again on Friday into New England, the Mid-Atlantic area of the Northeast. Also, the Carolinas It's going to stretch back to the Ohio Valley as well. So it's going to be a wet start to the weekend there, but really wet today. Soggy, soggy conditions. It was a soggy weekend in the South Central States. Look at all that rain falling right now. Again, Savannah, this is really beneficial rain, but we're looking at heavy rain that could cause some localized flooding over the next couple of days. Oof. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Sure. Well, more now on that major shakeup in British politics this morning. Suella Braverman is out and ex-Prime Minister David Cameron is in. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga joins us with more details on this. Hey, Claudia, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. That's right. This morning, the UK Prime Minister sacked the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, uh, over a major and shocking cabinet uh, reshuffle. And now David Cameron, as you mentioned, is back to British politics as Foreign Secretary about seven years after he had to step down as Prime Minister over the Brexit referendum. Now, Braverman came under major criticism after writing a contentious op-ed for The Times where she accused the police of bias. This is just one of a series of controversial moves from the now former Home Secretary, and now David Cameron is re-entering the political sphere in a bit of a, a jaw-dropping moment for British politics this morning. Now let's get to the latest out of Ukraine, where officials say Russian forces are ramping up attacks near Bakhmut and Adivka. Savannah, these are two key frontline cities, and if you remember, Bakhmut is also the site of this war's bloodiest battle before falling to Russian hands back in May. Since then, Ukraine recaptured the heights over Bakhmut, but in a telegram update just yesterday, Colonel General Alexander Sirsky wrote, quote, the Russians have become more active and are trying to recapture previously lost positions. He also says that the enemy attacks are being repelled. And we end our tour with a roar. Savannah, right here in Italy, a circus lion was captured after spending hours on the loose. It escaped from La Dispoli, an Italian town near here, Rome. So for a few hours, the hungriest creature roaming around was not a tourist, 
but a lion. Residents were <laughs> alerted after circus staff went to the cage and were surprised to find a broken lock and no lion in sight. It took a five hours long stroll around the streets before being sedated and returned to the circus. Well, the incident is still being investigated and thankfully uh, we didn't run into each other, otherwise I probably wouldn't be here to tell the story. Savannah. I can't believe that video of him just running down the street. Can you imagine seeing a lion? Wow. Yep. That is an investigation sounds like a good call. All right, Claudio, thank you very much. Well, coming up, a closer look at those tragic University of Idaho murders one year later. How the victims' families are remembering the young lives they've lost. That's next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. It's been one year since four University of Idaho students were stabbed to death in an off-campus house. The suspect, Brian Koberger, was arrested about six weeks later, thousands of miles away at his parents' house in Pennsylvania. He is still behind bars waiting for a trial date to be set. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us with more on how the families of the victims are honoring their loved ones one year later. Good morning. The victims' families are still waiting for their shot at justice. A suspect is, of course, in custody. A trial date hasn't been set. This, as an entire community today, mourns together. As suspected killer Brian Koberger awaits trial this morning, a somber commemoration for the families of Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonzalez, the four University of Idaho students stabbed to death one year ago. Four students were killed yesterday in a suspected homicide. Their murders rattling the small community of Moscow, Idaho. It took police six weeks to track down and arrest Koberger, more than 25 500 miles away from the crime scene. The former criminology student was linked to the killings, investigators say, by DNA found on a knife sheaf left on the bed where Gonzalez and Mogan were found dead. Now, one year after their daughter Kaylee's murder, Christy and Steve Gonzalez say they'll spend the day remembering their little girl. It's been rough. It's, it's been really rough. You just miss them, and, and the longer they're gone, the more you miss them, and the more you realize how badly you really have been robbed. In the 12 months since Ethan Chapin's murder, his mother Stacy wrote a children's book and helped establish the Ethan Smile Foundation in honor of her son's memory. I miss hugging Ethan. He's, he just always, he was definitely a mama's boy. I'd give anything to go back and be able to have another hug from him. While the judge has entered a not guilty plea on Koberger's behalf, a start date for his trial has not yet been set. The 28-year-old's legal team has made multiple failed attempts to get the case thrown out. But those delays have brought more time for investigators who were back at the crime scene last month, collecting even more evidence. It's more evidence, so then when we do go to trial, there'll just be more good days than there is those what-if days. Now, the four families united by immense loss, grieving this mournful milestone. Later today, a memorial will be held at the University of Idaho. Of course, a very somber time for the families and fellow students. Back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you. Joining us here in studio with more on this is legal analyst Angela Sanadella. Angela, always great to have you with us. So the murder trial was supposed to take place to get started in October, but then he waived his right to a speedy trial. Do we have any idea now when we might get a start date? We don't know. We know, as Miguel said, the defense has continually tried to raise motions to dismiss, which have been denied at every step. Remember, it's the defendant's right to a speedy trial. It's not the prosecution's. And in a case like this, where the death penalty is on the table, as the prosecution has declared it will be in this trial, it is not uncommon for the defense to continually try to delay, delay, delay. Prosecutors have said that they intend to seek the death penalty. And when we look at the available information at this point, what do you expect their case is going to be? Lay out what you think a strategy might be from them. Yeah, so I think the knife sheath and the DNA is extremely significant, although the knife itself has not been found yet. I also think the digital evidence in this case is expansive. We have surveillance camera video of his white Hyundai Elantra going back and forth in front of the house mm. multiple times at night. And we also have his phone being turned off in the exact two hours where allegedly the crimes happen. And then finally, it being turned back on and being tracked, leaving the area area after the crimes allegedly happened. That is huge. And do you expect they'll provide a motive? That's the big question. 
I'm not sure. And look, prosecutors never have to provide a motive, so they will if they believe the motive will be convincing. But there's always a risk also with providing a motive, and that's if the defense in any way can debunk the motive, then often that gives the jury a way to actually go for the defense. So we'll see if the prosecution does present a motive or not. All right, Angela Sanadella, thank you so much. Well, coming up, we've got a story of love and loss and healing. After the break, one man's strenuous journey to honor his fallen family members. That's up next. Welcome back. Let's get to some money news, starting with a hard no from some Ford workers over the latest labor proposal in Kentucky. CNBC's Pippa Stevens has that and other financial headlines for us. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Hey, Savannah. UAW production workers at Ford's assembly and truck plants in Kentucky have voted against a proposed new contract. The union's local unit saying skilled trade workers at those factories voted in favor of the deal. The UAW and Ford have yet to comment. Members are voting on contracts from Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler owner Stellantis. On Friday, workers at GM's assembly plant in Flint, Michigan, narrowly voted against the proposed agreement. Meantime, do not try to buy and flip your new Cybertruck. Tesla has added a clause in the purchase agreement saying buyers can't sell their new vehicle within the first year unless they have specific permission or they may be sued. Offenders could also be banned from buying Tesla vehicles in the future. The company may grant some exceptions, but they must get written consent. Tesla may then buy back the Cybertruck at a reduced price. And Dior wants to help your baby keep their baby soft skin. The luxury goods company has launched a new line of infant skin care called Baby Dior. It's a reimagining of the infant perfume the brand sold back in 1970. It comes as a four-piece collection, scented water, moisturizer, body and hair foam, and a cleaning water. You can get yours right now at select Dior boutiques and online. The whole collection retails for about $350. Savannah, back oh, to you. Yeah. Dior scented water for a baby. Mm -hmm. Top of the list. <laughs> All right, Pippa, thank you very much. Well, now to a story about heartbreak and healing. NBC's Peter Alexander takes us on one man's journey to recovery after the devastating loss of both of his college-age sisters to a house fire and how he used fitness as a way to restore himself and honor their memory. For an athlete, training can be an intense, solitary journey. But for Zach Weiner, it's sacred time when he never feels alone. When you're training, who are you thinking about? Jillian and Lindsay, always. My training is really my time to remember the happy times. And there were so many happy times. Jillian and Lindsay, not just Zach's sisters, but his best friends. Jillian, she was adventurous, spunky, soulful, but also had this silly, goofy side to her. Lindsay is the epitome of love, would walk into a room and light it up. Just over a year ago, Zach and his family were all together enjoying a summer vacation at a rental home when their world was shattered. In the middle of the night, woke up and uh, the house was on fire. My parents made it out. I made it out of the window in my bedroom, but Jillian and Lindsay didn't make it out. They were just 21 and 19. Is there even a way to describe that level of grief, losing your two sisters? I mean, it is a pain and sadness that is more intense than anything I've ever felt. They were my people, you know, they're the ones that I did life with. Life without them was unimaginable. As Zach describes, it simply putting one foot in front of the other felt impossible. But as time passed, Zach knew to heal, he needed to honor his sisters. How can I do something today that they'd be happy about? I had started to look towards fitness. But fitness alone was not enough. Zach set his sights on completing one of the greatest challenges in sports, the Ironman. A more than two mile swim, 112 mile bike ride with a marathon to cap it off. Did people say you're nuts or did they say, that's brilliant. I, I got a little of both. What, what's your, your personal best in the marathon? I was like, I haven't done one of those. So uh, big cyclist, right? I was like, no. OK, so college swimmer. Yeah, like, no, I don't really know how to swim. Zach teamed up with a coach and spent the next year focused on a Saturday in September, the date of the Ironman Maryland, also his 25th birthday. 
I'm running this race in honor of Jillian and Lindsay. Go get it. His motivation, their voices. This video, a graduation gift from his sisters that he now cherishes. I have a six minute video of Jillian and Lindsay being themselves on my phone and telling me how much they love me, how proud they are of me. You're our role model and our best friend, and we love you so much, and we're so, so, so proud of you. That's going to stay in my heart uh, and be what I'm thinking of the, the entire race. I cannot be more proud to call you my brother. I love you so, so much. And cheering him on, family and friends, all decked out in pink, Lindsay's favorite color. 11 hours later, exhaustion and exhilaration. For Zach, more than a race, but a moment to remember. Oh, how incredible. Our thanks to Peter Alexander for that inspiring story. Well, coming up, it was a romantic Argentinian rendezvous for power couple Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey over the weekend, taking her incredible eras toward South America with some major surprises for the Swifties in tow. We are on Taylor Watch up next. Welcome back. It was a wild weekend for Taylor Swift fans. Not only did the superstar launch the South American leg of her international heiress tour, but her romance with chief star Travis Kelsey was very publicly sealed backstage in Argentina with a kiss. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has all of it for us. Hey, Emily, good morning. Good morning to you. My jaw literally dropped when I saw this video. It's the kiss scene around the world, viewed millions of times on social media. And that's just the icing on the cake for Swift, who not only sold out three shows, in South America's largest venue this weekend, but she was just nominated for six Grammy Awards. Over the weekend, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey appearing to make their romance official with a very public kiss. The sweet moment quickly going viral and throwing the internet into a frenzy. It happened after her show on Saturday, the pop superstar running off the stage and into Kelsey's arms, planting a kiss on his lips in full view of her fans. Swifties screaming their approval on social media. Kelsey taking advantage of an off week for the Chiefs to fly to Buenos Aires to spend time with his new sweetheart and see her in concert. And she did not disappoint. The singer even changing the lyrics of her Grammy nominated hit song Karma to reflect her current romance with the Super Bowl champion. The newest Chief Swift fan adorably holding his face in response and Swifties shrieking in glee. Swift's dad enjoying the moment as well. On Friday, the couple was also seen holding hands and heading to dinner after her concert was canceled for bad weather. We love you, Taylor. And one of Swift's surprise song selections further fueling speculation that she's falling in love. And it's not just her love life that's hitting on all cylinders. It's me. Was just nominated for six Grammys, including Song of the Year for Antihero, her seventh nomination in that category, breaking a record held by legends Paul McCartney and Lionel Richie, and further propelling her superstardom. And meanwhile, 1989, Taylor's version is having stunning success, even for the pop star who is used to topping the charts. The re-release was bigger than the rest of the top 50 albums on the Billboard 200 combined, according to Forbes, when looking at sales and streams. And remember, this is all for her re-recorded effort. Right. So and that's also album. her best release ever. And yep. then her second best release ever was Midnight's, which was the one right before that. So I'm like, she's just getting more and more famous. Yes. Like, I think they're just going to keep continuing to be the best yep. release she's ever had, which is wild. Wild. So much too much for me to handle. <laughs> Emily, kind of, thank you so much. Well, finally this hour, a show of support. A group of dads at schools across Louisville, Kentucky are doing their part to bring joy and motivation to elementary school kids. NBC News correspondent Kate Snow has the story. There you go, there you go, there you go. At elementary schools across Louisville, Kentucky, up top, man. Up top, up top. some mornings start with a big surprise. Hugs, high fives, smiles, and support. Once a month, the Flash Dads show up, a program started in Jefferson County Public Schools seven years ago. Dozens of dads with all kinds of jobs. Army veteran James Bogan and Police Lieutenant Roger Collins are regulars. What's a Flash Dad? It's just 
dads, community members showing up for students who sometimes don't have anybody show up for them. Been in the, with the program since day one. My grandson went to the school that they were going to. So I felt it was a great opportunity for me to surprise him as well. And I tell you, it's, it's contagious. I've been doing it ever since. What keeps you coming back? The kids, the students, the energy. Oh, my man. Erica Walker is the principal at Audubon Traditional Elementary. It sounds like such a simple thing, you know, a, a bunch of dads greeting everybody. Men's presence um, in elementary school is just amazing. Everyone doesn't have a father in their home, a positive role model in their home, so that when they do see these men in schools, you know, they step in and they're able to give the students the encouragement and the motivation they need to be here. A joy, too, for the flash dads. Nothing better than partying with, you know, 300, 400 elementary schools, uh, stu school students at 9 o'clock in the morning. And they're looking for mentors. Mm -hmm. These kids, they need these mentors. And that's what we do. So we continue to reach out to these students and let them know we're not there just that day. We're there whenever you need us. It's not a one-day event. It's a lifetime event. Wow, what an incredible story. And our thanks to our friend Kate Snow for that reporting. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.